Sam, you seem to have something interesting set up there since we don't see you. Uh, why don't you tell us what you're, uh, you're putting together there? Yeah, so, so um, I started off COVID semester, right, right after spring break with having to put some videos online so students could do some video analysis on labs. And I quickly learned that lighting is really important. So what you're seeing right now is the light kit that I ordered after I saw some really crummy videos and they're illuminating some other demos up here. One of the requests was, hey, how do you do um, attraction and repulsion of uh, currents and wires? Um, so over here, I have a power supply. This will put out 110 amps. If you don't have one, buy one. They're awesome. So current can leave the power supply going to this conductor here, go through, up to here, down through here. So here we have what kind of currents, parallel or anti-parallel? Somebody yell. I can't tell if I'm gonna say parallel. Okay, so the current comes in here, is connected to here, goes through this conductor, comes up, comes down, goes through that conductor. So in each conductor down here, the currents are going that way. So the currents are all parallel. Okay, so the currents are parallel. And if I turn on the power supply by hitting the output, you see that the wires are indeed attracted. And if I change this so that the currents are anti-parallel, and of course, if I was doing this for a lab or a demonstration, I would be a little more careful with my terminology, um, how I go about showing things, um, explaining, so on and so forth, but you can see that that's now repelled, right? So we'll start. Current goes on three, two, one now, and you see that the wires are repelled. So there's um, attracting and repelling wires from currents. Dale. So oh, I will make two comments about that. If you're really serious about buying one of those power supplies, make sure that you get one that can be short circuited. Uh, otherwise, some of them automatically kick out the minute they sense a short circuit. So you've got to have one that will allow a short mm -hmm. circuit directly through uh, the uh, system like that. Um, the other one is uh, poor boys, uh, version of that is to buy like a small motorcycle battery or a, uh, for me, I use diehard uh, 12 volt batteries for this, but the power supply, if you're going to spend money for that, make sure you can do a short circuit on that for sure, because it's too expensive to try to buy one and then figure out it doesn't work. What do you do with it then? So if you're in a situation where you can control it for safety, a, a battery, a marine battery, and a battery charger is less expensive and uh, easy to have ready for a number of other demonstrations. But again, wouldn't use that in the lab though. In the lab, I think the, the power supply is the way to go. Correct. So there's a, a question that's come up in the chat, um, it, it, which probably is a common one for a lot of the demos that you're gonna do, which is, the lighting system that you use uh, that Sam showed in, in his demo, whether he meant to or not, uh, and where and how to get that as well, not only the, the power supply. Okay, so the lighting system was about $1,000. I got that from B&H Photo, it came as a kit. Um, oh, let me reverse my camera again. So there's this one large 18 inch light source and then a couple of smaller light sources. They could, they're on tripods, the tripods came with it, blah, blah, blah. The other thing that I ordered from B&H was this large backdrop, and I have a couple of different color backdrops. I chose white. Um, so having that nice uniform background really helped the videos. The other thing I have that I'm not using right now, but I have used it in some other videos, is this um, reflector, again, that came in the kit. You get all this for like a thousand bucks or thirteen hundred dollars, something like that. Um, so, so the lighting is really important. The next question was on the power supply. This is a power supply, as Dale mentioned. 
it is meant to be short circuited. It's a low voltage, high current power supply. It's Instec model number PSW30108. And um, you saw on the, the, the up close video, well, that's actually a kind of a cool um, demonstration right there, seeing all the multiplexing happening with the display on that. But if you look, this is putting out 113 amps at 4.4 volts right now, no problem. Um, the wires up here are getting just slightly warm, slightly warm, and that's with 110 amps going through them, which is really cool. Okay, other questions? Well, I want to add comments? in, I, I want to note that the, a lighting system is great if there's a budget situation, but especially for those of you teaching high school and where you don't have resource budget, one of the best places and the best things you can do is getting lamps, like even an old lamp like this that I have. Um, and I basically use a bunch of lamps, uh, uh, light supplies of the type that we often have in various experiment kits are great. Um, you can use LED bulbs, incandescent bulbs, and uh, the best place to find lamps like this uh, usually are, are your Goodwill and Salvation Army stores. So you can pick up a, a bunch of normal lamps for a couple bucks, um, and you can do a lot of lighting that way, especially when you're lighting for the table or a lab bench. So I'll jump in on that. Um, a lot of the high school people especially are going to be doing this on their cameras. Uh, we have found that using your camera, the uh, color balancing and stuff like that is so good that a lot of times you don't need extra lighting. And so a lot of times if I want to do something, I have some pull down screens in my lecture room that are just white background. Just shove your table up against that. Uh, put your camera on a tripod or something that holds it up and go ahead with your camera. Uh, we did a whole series of lectures since March with that and even the demos and everything that we did, we just zoomed them with the camera, turned out excellent. Uh, in fact, uh, the camera resolution was better than the video camera that I was using to tape the lecture at the same time. So uh, color balance uh, going from light to dark, we were doing optics experiments, the uh, emission lines and that kind of stuff. Camera worked great. Uh, has automatic stuff, so you don't have to sit and fiddle with it a lot. You just point it at stuff and go, and it works great. I'll add in that I've got two images right now as a great comparison. Um, the one I'm looking straight on at you is through a Dell laptop. The other image is actually coming through my cell phone. So you can see exactly what Dale described. The colors are much more vivid from the camera in my cell phone than they are in the computer. And I often use a two camera system like that, my computer and my cell phone, when I'm, anytime I'm recording me talking and then the camera might be on the laboratory activity that I'm recording. And I, I do wanna point out, again, instead of buying a bunch of tripods, a lot of us already have the bare essentials to make our own in our labs. Um, this is just a, you know, a hundred year old lab stand with a right angle clamp and a three finger clamp. And, and I have my cell phone right now and another one, and you can put your cell phone right in there with equipment you may already have and not have to go out and buy any special attachments and things like that. I had extra money in my budget and I thought this was a very good use for it. So <laughs> absolutely. What I was showing you before was you were saying you had a nice white backdrop. My backdrop was a very glossy, shiny whiteboard, um, which would have stripes through it. So that's why I needed a better backdrop. Use one of your buttons. I'll add one of the great things that I, you know, I usually look for at fabric stores are large blocks of uh, leftover fabric. So this tabletop cover is just a uh, uh, huge piece of uh, black canvas that was left over. And so like when I've done things for the local television station or other recordings, it's good to have a black backdrop. My lab tables are black, so that helps. The chalkboards behind me are black. And so even a can of black spray paint um, on a wall, not that you all want to do that in your home, although some people 
might be doing that uh, if this continues. Uh, and kind of create your own home backdrop like that. Yeah, so um, somebody just asked an interesting question. So Aaron Berger just asked about um, a cell phone. And yeah, when I look at my screen, mm -hmm. uh, oh, maybe it's just the orientation. I'm on an iPad right now just um, for, for people if they want to know if I change. Oh, how's that? Is that better, Aaron? Do you like that? Okay, Mel is mine. So, okay, so I just turned my iPad 90 degrees, and uh, I think we, we get a better image. Yeah, okay, Aaron's agreeing. Very I'm good. I'm going to turn my cell phone 90 degrees. I don't know how that turned out, but yeah. That works. So there was another interesting question that came through the chat, which is, the, the benefits of live streaming labs or demos versus pre-recording and really the, the, some of the technologies used for both. Uh, I'll start. Um, I've made recordings primarily using GoToMeeting just because it creates an MP4, which I can download after the fact, um, have multiple cameras logged in. Uh, that's what I usually do. I find it a little, it just doesn't work as well under Zoom, but go to meeting. That's that's how we go. I will say that um, for us, uh, it really didn't make any difference. Uh, the one thing that we did do for our lecture was uh, went to a musician's friend, bought a uh, forty-nine dollar microphone attachment that you could plug into your cell phone so that you weren't getting the uh, background noise of the room itself. Uh, you were only listening to the instructor, but uh, that was fairly cheap. It looks just like a regular uh, wireless microphone system, um, but uh, it plugs right into a cell phone uh, with the uh, multiple input tap that they have there and uh, worked great. We've been using it ever since uh, March 15th and uh, it hasn't let us down yet. We're just starting another class and using it for that. Do you have the link for that, Dale? A musician's friend? No, no, no. For musician. the specific microphone. Uh, I can look. I and think you guys. I think you guys need to address some of this in-class uh, collaboration and stuff. I'll look at the microphone while you do that. Right. Uh, I'll I'll take uh, a moment here on on the lab side of things. What we found is uh, doing a little bit of both. Um, to get through the rest of the COVID semester, uh, we had our labs synchronously logged in during their lab time uh, through, uh, through Zoom. We had, they would work with their lab partners in breakout groups. We had pre-recorded videos of certain components of the lab. Um, they could watch those on their own machine and then interact with their lab partners as if they had taken that data. Um, so they still did their lab report during a a two hour lab period um, using almost the same methods we were using before COVID. It's just that they didn't have the act of manually getting the data. They watched the video and, and we also could record that for anyone who had an asynchronous situation. So we did a little of both. Okay, getting back to the wireless system. Uh, basically, this is it. This is your wireless microphone pack. It looks just like regular wireless microphone if you use those in your classroom. The uh, system is just a Nady DKW-3. Looks just like this. It's just a little uh, uh, receiver. Wireless microphone is the transmitter. You plug it directly into your camera. It comes with the adapter for that. Uh, comes with the power supply, everything you need. You just plug it in and go. Like so I said, the output of the receiver goes, it's an eighth inch jack into your camera? Uh, so, yep. Um, with the, uh, for like the iPhone, it has like four uh, bands on the uh, little mini jack that goes in there. It comes with that. Uh, the output on the uh, thing is just a quarter inch uh, phono. But... Uh, it comes with a cord and then it comes with that adapter so you can just plug that right into your phone. So that's it. What was the name of the manufacturer again and the model number? Uh, Nady, N-A-D-Y. And uh, I, we got it from Musician's Friend. You can probably get it on Amazon too. But the uh, 
the system is just a D is in dog, K is in whatever, and W dash <laughs> three. I'm not conversant in uh, uh, military speak, so my letters get lost. But D is in Dale, K, W dash three. It's been working great for us and it's cheap. I mean, you know, $49, I think, was what we paid and we've been using it like crazy, so. And the big question is what we're all going to have to do for the fall. I know right now we're preparing for a whole range of possibilities from back in the lab completely to continuing it as we're doing, just trying to get by until we can get back in. I, I don't think anyone wants to permanently put hands-on physics activities permanently online where that's the only way we do things. I, I, I don't think there's any, uh, any, any sense that, we have to get there. But. Um, I think a lot of people are going to be in that boat. Um, I know that we have looked into buying uh, lab kits uh, or renting them for like 200 bucks a kit or something and sending them out to students. I know Minnesota mm -hmm. uh, put together like 1,400 kits under $200 that they were sending out to the people who were taking classes this summer. Uh, Brian was keeping me updated on that, but he was having a real fun time, him and the lab manager, putting those things together, trying to find quantities, mass quantities to put together in the lab. That was their biggest problem. But um, a lot of you are going to be um, looking at people like David and Sam, who already have some maybe labs or videos of labs online. Uh, you know, you aren't going to be able to make them yourselves a lot of times, so you're going to have to look around and find some. Um, I think AAPT has some uh, resources available where you can look through and try to find some decent labs. And so I know question. That, yeah, oh, the numbers. So the, the, the Minnesota lab kits are $200 per kit? Their, their budget was $200 per lab kit, and they were doing like $1,400 wow that's a lot of dough yep it that's is. above my budget when we consider there are some vendors out there who've tried this and uh i know the science source tried it and they ended up not making a go of it they got bought out by science first yep. i think it's east science labs that's out there that manufactures kits out in colorado and um, it's not an easy endeavor and you know we we talked about that a little bit but you know, you can't even assume that people have, your students have things at home that we would think, well, of course, they're, they can find a piece of wire or a push pin. No, you can't assume anything at, at home. And you can't just expect them to go to Home Depot or Lowe's or the equivalent Menards or wherever you might be and, and pick something up. Um, and, and so even if you send that kit for 200 bucks, there is one thing that you assumed they had at home and they can't do. And then we think of we think of large things that you know obviously I've, I've got bell jars out here because I've been playing with things and uh, you know students aren't going to have a bell jar at home or a vacuum system so you know the whole range of things I mean do we want students doing calorimetry at home with flames I, I don't think so where do we go so who paid for those kits the university paid for those kits or did the student have to pay an extra fee. Minnesota has a very big lab budget, but mm -hmm. their limit was to try to keep the kits below $200 and still get a full semester or summer school's worth of labs in the kit. Structurally, and, I think, Dale, they were going through their bookstore, if I remember Brian telling me. Right. So students would have to buy it through the bookstore. The bookstore would ship it. Of course, that adds in a cost too. Um, as the science source found, if you're going to send somebody uh, a, a science kit, um, you can't have anything very weighty in there. They had the big issue of how do you send a five, you know, a couple 500 gram masses. Yep. And they ended up with a novel idea, which many of us could use, using water bottles and having the water bottles marked. So you fill it with the right amount of water and you'll have, uh, you'll have the mass you need for heavier masses. I will, I will mention that Brian indicated that the biggest problem they were having was finding enough shipping boxes. Sure. UPS didn't have enough, uh, US Post Office didn't have enough, 
that was their biggest problem was once they got the kit assembled to find enough boxes to ship them out. I don't know how they solved it. You have to have a box vendor. I mean, you have to have a cardboard vendor. They couldn't, they couldn't find one that had enough right. stuff in stock. Yeah, because it's all, these kinds of things are all done ahead of time. And, and what Minnesota's pulled off is frankly, frankly amazing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's, and, and that's right. exactly what, you but know, that's a, a high school teacher can't do. I mean, that's a Herculean effort. You aren't going to be able to do that with a no. high school. I mean, my son in his six physics classes slotted for the fall, he's got probably 120 students. There's no way a small rural high school has anywhere, you know, near the capability to send out 120 kids. So you really have to look for things that can be done with, I guess, what are everyday items at home. Well, that's, um, what, I'm, that's what I'm saying that people like you and Sammy have done labs where they can do their analysis uh, or video analysis uh, and not have to have the equipment. They can take the measurements of the stuff that you're doing and a lot of that kind of stuff is online. You just have to really spend some time looking for it. I will go ahead and say that somewhere near the end of the summer, um, the University of Maine, we will share um, what we're developing. Um, we're not sure exactly how or where, but um, we will. I mean, we took our existing laboratory manual and said, what do we need to film to be able to do as many of these labs as possible, um, no matter would, what the student is? I would suggest so, you talk to sorry. AAPT and have them put it there. The, um, by the way, we have a question here from one of the participants. Uh, Debbie has, has a question. Hey, no, I actually just wanted to add into the conversation um, about, uh, you know, how can we set these kits? And from the high school teacher's perspective, I teach freshmen. Um, and I was trying to, I was doing circuits remotely and I really wanted them to move away from the FET, like let's have them do something at home. But something that David said uh, earlier was just like, you can't assume that they have a piece of wire, <laughs> which I was like, they gotta have a piece of wire. But I did a little survey with them. Um, you know, I was asking, do you have wire? Do you have a bulb? Do you have a magnet? Like there's all these little things that you would think that you would have, but because we're physics teachers, so we have them, <laughs> but yeah. they don't necessarily have these things at home. So, you know, I was thinking about for the fall, I was going to discuss this with my, well, at least with my district and saying like, listen, I want to, I want these kits assembled for all the incoming freshmen that, that want them to have these things. And, you know, it depends on what I start with, but maybe I'll start with a topic. I usually always start, you know, with the classic mechanics, but maybe I'll start with a topic where I can each send them home with like, you know, a laser pointer or something. And, and I'm talking about just, you know, like the laser pointer, at least where I'm from the dollar store. I'm not looking the dog at the toy one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like it, that, you know, you could do a lot with that. I could start with light instead. So that's definitely a discussion I'm looking to have with my district about um, if we're going to be going remote, you know, we can't control that. But what I can control is at least trying to emphasize the experiences that they're going to have in their home, especially because, you know, they're not going to know me. So I want to at least supply them with something. Like, how is this any different than asking them to, you know, bring a binder and notebooks and five different notebooks for every different class or a pencil, you know? Like, it's kind of like these are going to be slightly new materials for them to bring or that we supply them with. Yeah, the supply list is really going to be strange. Uh, steel wool and a 9-volt battery, right? I mean, you know. Exactly. You know, maybe they have steel wool at home, but, you know, they wouldn't. They, they probably have never, freshmen have probably never used steel wool for anything at that age. I, you know, unless they're like working, you know, on something in the shop. I do want to encourage everyone to record yourself. Record yourself even if you have uh, a cough or, well, maybe not a cough right now, but uh, a hiccup or anything like that. Let that stay. Uh, if you misspeak a word, don't worry about going back and re-recording re it. Because Debbie, what you said, that's really important. They need to know you as if they were in the room with you. And in and, and the classes I'm, I, I teach right now, I mean, I, I let those things stay. If I misspeak, I, I fix it right away. Um, but you want them to know you. And honestly, any recording you can make, even doing a demonstration slightly wrong, uh, or it didn't work out perfectly, is better than going up to any number of the sites, uh, pyra-online.org, 
which is the Pyra home site. Uh, we have workshop videos from the lecture demo workshops going back, what, help me, Dale, Sam, 20, 25 years? I mean, yeah, say 20. At least, yeah. I mean, I remember in 2006 in Syracuse, we recorded, I think, every demo we did at the workshop. And those top 200 demos, they're still online at, at pyra-online.org um, under a pretty identifiable side task pane. I think it says uh, Pyra 200. Okay, so I think you should get back to the question. I have one here from Andrew that uh, Mark sent me. Uh, what are people finding to be the most convenient tools to simulate writing on a whiteboard? Uh, he has some examples, Zoom's virtual whiteboard, MS OneNote, and Wacom's uh, writing tablet versus touch screens. Quite frankly, we don't use those. If we're recording a lecture, the teacher is right in front of the blackboard. We just point the camera at him, and he just does like his regular lecture uh, when we're doing that. Um, if you're sitting in your basement, I imagine that that's going to be a little different, but uh, quite frankly, I don't have experience with a lot of those other ones because that's not the way we do it. Well, I'm going to demonstrate what I've done um, out of, uh, you know, needing something to be able to do here. Um, and that is taking my cell phone, and I do this with the classes I teach, again, multiple camera method, and normally I'd have lighting. And so I take a sheet of paper and then I can do everything I want. I don't have a Sharpie in my pocket like I normally do, but you know, that's one approach you can take if you have your computer and you have your cell phone and you don't have anything else and you don't have the budget, this works out pretty well. Um, again, use Sharpies and, and it ends up looking a lot as if you were on, um, you know, using something fancier. So Dale, someone else posted a question on inserting questions into your videos. And I think you're experimenting with that right now, correct? Which is doing what? Inserting uh, questions into your videos, um, you know, uh, like cl clicker questions into your videos. We do. Usually the instructor does that um, uh, with the supplemental stuff that he puts online. We have a device we call Icon, which is where all the classroom stuff goes. <clears throat> it's a software package the university has. But basically they upload their video. They upload, uh, they can upload to PowerPoint, whatever they want. The clicker questions, usually nowadays, we don't call them clicker questions because there's no in-class participation. Uh, so what we're doing is uh, putting them out as ponder this and, uh, uh, you know, email me later at uh, office hours as to what you want to do or talk to me later in office hours, Zoom, zoomed in. But um, mostly all of that is going to problems at the end of the lecture type deal. Um, we aren't inserting those into our lecture that we're recording right now. Uh, although they are there and they are online for the students to get into and look at and make their predictions. Uh, it's just that there's no participation type situation. That's just all individual now. I did see someone make that comment I would make too about literally saying in the video recording, all right, pause right now and, and answer question so-and-so on, you know, you could use a system like Top Hat. And so they could, they could be doing that asynchronously answering a question. Along. Correct. Our, our yeah. teacher, the instructor I'm videotaping right now, leaves those till the end to be answered and pondered overnight. And then tomorrow is the day when you answer those uh, when he has um, you can either answer them during lecture and, and write the uh, comments as we do the uh, video or um, most, most of the time that's office hours that take place the next day that you have questions about. Yeah, now I, I was mis misremembering. It's our brother Stan out in Oregon who is working on a system right now. He's been doing a crash course in this video system 
where you can actually insert the, the quicker question and wait for a response before the video then continues on. And I forget what the name of that software is, but it's available through his university. So if you really want to do that, you know, get in touch with Stan Miklazina at Oregon. His email is stanm at oregon.edu, I think. Were there more questions, Mark, that you had seen come along? And Mark's so, muted. Go ahead. Dave, I'm thinking you have a lot of cool stuff back there. You want to show us something? Sure. Well, I had something that's kind of fun right here. Uh, I've got a marshmallow man made under a bell jar. And this is kind of a fun demonstration to do for a small class. So I've got a vacuum pump. Over you gotta here. turn. You got to turn your camera, but dude. No, you just no, have to. No, look I got to turn other the other camera. camera. You can pin the other oh. camera that's on him. I see. But we'll bring him down there. I got her. There we go. And we're taking air out through a hose. And it looks like it's. You know, that's the thing about a demonstration. Something's always not quite doing right here. Plug it in. <laughs> it is plugging in. Oh, yeah, it's starting to take the air out. There we go. Yeah, there we go. We're pulling the air out. And if you look closely at the marshmallow man, uh, he's getting bigger. So what are we doing? Of course, marshmallows are, are filled with pockets of air. And as I put the vacuum pump on it and start trying to pump air out, that air is uh, uh, inside of the marshmallow isn't seeing the pressure on the outside of the marshmallow so it starts to expand now beside it i could demonstrate at the same time if i had two vacuum pumps here's a balloon under atmosphere and of course you know if i pulled air out from outside this balloon would also start to get larger right well the marshmallows are doing the same thing and probably the next time i do this demonstration I'm gonna put a, a ruler inside, you know, with really good markings, and then we can see his height grow. And I've always wondered, astronauts in space, of course, you know, they gain an inch in height, right? So if you reduce the pressure, do they get taller? I, I don't think so. Do it, let's find out. <laughs> yeah, let's find out. Unplug, Are they going up tomorrow? Unplug, up tomorrow. The Unplug the hose. Unplug the hose. All right, well, here we go. We're gonna find out what happens. I'm gonna close this off first. Turn off the vacuum pump. I'm gonna open it up, let's see. Now we're letting air back in. Well, we would actually pumped a lot of air out of there. Well, that was my first experiment with giant marshmallows. I'd honestly never used them before, and I thought, well, they probably work better. And I guess my conclusion is I'm going to stick with regular marshmallows. Uh, let's see. I take the pump now. There we go. We'll take him out of there. Yeah, he didn't do very much. Sam, I think I've seen you do it recently, right? With, with uh, Pete. Yeah. So let's try it. Let's try it while I'm here with Pete. So actually, I'm going to change over to this other vacuum plate. Smaller vacuum, easier to work with. So we'll do it first with the balloon. Can I send you a link so you could buy a real vacuum pump? <laughs> I was gonna say that one's pretty slow. Yeah, well, I think it's because I've got a bad hose here. I'm pretty sure it's the bad hose. Yeah, you got a leak somewhere. I do, I've got a leak somewhere. And then Dave made an important point. You should always have a somewhere in your video so you have a scale of reference yeah so you, i don't know if you noticed i didn't point it out but i do have a meter stick um in this video over on my ring flinger you can see the piece of tape where i would 
attach a meter stick so you can get a scale of things, that, which is not always apparent when you're filming your apparatus and putting them up on YouTube or sending video files or whatever. Oh, there we go. That's a lot better now. We see, we see the balloon uh, filling the chamber up and then popping. Excellent. We'll turn off okay, now do the peeps. And now it's so time for your peeps. What was your problem before? Why, why was the vacuum not working so great? The, uh, I think the hose. I've got a rather old hose that I was using. Yeah, but what did you do differently that time? I squeezed the hose on even tighter. Oh, got it, okay. All right, so we'll try now some peeps left over from, how, from uh, Easter. Oh, way better. Oh, yeah. Oh, lovely. Those just look delicious now, don't they? Everyone see those clearly? They're, they look kind of scaly now. All right, let's see what happens. Come back to the atmosphere. Oh, yeah. Do you have an original size one there for comparison? Sure. All right, here we go. They're kind of flat now, huh? <laughs> but this suggests that I'm just going to take this clump of marshmallows. And although he won't stand up like he should, let's just put those in there and try it again in the small chamber. So while we're, we're watching this, I have a, another question here, which is, one that's been a, a kind of a reoccurring question in, in many of these sessions, which is uh, we have students that are working either synchronous, synchronously or asynchronously. And right. you described, someone described this it's a lab scenario where you had the students working synchronously, they'd all show up working lab groups. Um, does anyone have any experience uh, or advice for students that may be doing lab experiments asynchronously but still in groups, meaning they still have partners and you want them to, to work together. You know, how do you facilitate, you know, the working together uh, outside of a lab time? Uh, and if there's any specific tools that you, that seem to work well for that process. So what I've done is I, I've allowed students to collaborate outside of the scheduled lab time on their own, you know, if they're, if they're in very vastly different time zones, you know, that's a problem that they have to overcome. That's something that we can't really help them with. Um, and what I'm planning for the fall, uh, as Syracuse is, is planning on opening up full in-person classes a week earlier this year and sending them home at Thanksgiving break to stay home for the rest of the semester. So what I'm going to do here is instead of having a lab section full of 21 students, I still want to maintain safe social distancing practices. So I'm going to allow seven students at a time into the lab, one at each station. Um, there will be some sort of shields up. Try ordering Lexan right now. You can't find it anywhere. So if nope. you're looking to do this for the fall, don't wait, get on that right now. But anyways, you know, sneeze guards um, between the lab stations, they'll be allowed 30 minutes to go in and collect their data and then go home and work with friends offline and then turn their lab results in at a later time. I'm sort of experimenting with that this summer, um, except that there's no in-person component of the course. It's all offline, um, or sorry, it's all online this summer. So that, that's what's going on this summer. But yeah, start looking for Lexan right now if you want to do something like that. Um, I, I'll throw in what one of the things we do in one of the courses is each of the group of lab group students um, write a, a shared report um, using Google Docs. And so they have their own folder. Uh, they write their report in each of them or they alternate each week with that responsibility for. And of course, Google Doc tracks who wrote what. Um, so that gives the TA or the instructor the ability to, to see that somebody did work beyond just changing one sentence. Um, 
it does take a lot of work. But fortunately for us, we were in that course, we were doing that that way before COVID. So doing it after COVID uh, worked out pretty well. I'm not sure how you start it, though, if you don't have them in the room where you talk them through that. Method. It's a little harder. Speaking of that, um, how to, getting on that question of how do you start it, right? So this is, I think many of us are facing this um, question of how do we start the year off with social distancing rather than finish the year? Because those are distinctly different problems. Yeah. yeah. You know, so how do we build lab skills at the beginning uh, that, um, you know, the dexterity of manipulating something or even the questions that you ask when you go into an investigation uh, remotely or at a distance or, you know, all the things that you would do at the beginning, you know, to instill those kind of habits that then pay off later. I'll go, uh, I think modeling is the key way, and I don't mean the modeling method here. I mean the instructor modeling the behavior. So it comes back to recording. Uh, it comes back to recording, perhaps the instructor making a measurement, showing and talking while they're doing it, the things they do in the lab when they're starting out, uh, collecting a number of videos like that. I mean, normally they watch each other in the lab and that's the key component they're missing if they're not in the room. Not only, Debbie, as you pointed out a while ago, um, you know, they don't get to know you, they don't get to know each other. And so I, I really wonder how we make that, make that work. Um, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm filling out these questions, of course, you know, if anyone, uh, any of the participants has an answer or uh, further questions, uh, I hope you chime in. Um, I think probably one of the hardest things that could be starting the year off uh, in the lab context is uh, building the ability or the um, building persistence, right? Because we know that there's great value in students trying something and having it not work and then figuring it out and trying it again and even the collaboration between students as they go through that process uh, you know if students are working at home or in their dorm room or watching a video of a lab where things are working because you made a video of it <laughs> how, how do we how do we teach students or how do we get students to have that persistence Yeah, that's a tough one. I think in these times, we can't have everything we want as much as we do. You know, so, so you have to cut bait with, you know, some things you, you can do without and focus on what's important. What I told my TAs at the start of summer is they go into class with a list of things that's like 100 things long. You need to pare that list down to like 25 mm -hmm. because you know, the 100 things realistically under normal conditions needs to be pared down to 50. With these conditions, you need to pare that down even further. So yeah, we have all these expectations for lab, rank them in order of importance and start whittling off the bottom most ones because you can't address everything. It's the old less is more argument that doing six labs very well over a semester is honestly better than doing 16. And, you know, that, that, that opinion took over probably 25, 30 years ago at the university level, a lot of places where we got away from doing single one shot labs week after week after week to doing labs that extended over two weeks. Um, I, I want to throw in that there, there's, there are two elements that I get out of the other non physics courses that I teach. And, and one is the value of discussion groups which aren't something we normally have, you know, in the course with a lab or the class. And those of you who teach high school, of course, you do have various discussion forums, but especially those of us at the university level, um, we have them in other places. We may have them for the class in general, but for a laboratory, it can really help to have a discussion forum where students having an issue with the lab can put it out in a, some community environment with their, you know, all the students in their group uh, and they can often, the, that peer interaction is what I fear we lose the most uh, after the instructor interaction is that peer, peer interaction. And, and I mentioned the, the other thing is, if you have the discussion forum, what I find with these other classes I teach 
is the first discussion is always introduce yourself. And I know that seems, you know, in the real classroom, we would never take the time to honestly to go around a, you know, I'm in a lecture hall that seats 230. Um, after the first three weeks, we might have finally made it around the room. Um, but the beauty of, of being able, as someone pointed out, everyone has a smartphone. Um, you can ask every student to maybe record a short video to introduce themselves um, to the people, not just their, you know, not just the lab as a whole, but particularly anyone you may have them partnering up with as lab partners, just to create some sort of human condition. Because, you know, we talk about all the lab skills, we have a great lab document, um, but the working well with others is in there too. And, and that's one of the things that we're already finding this summer uh, that, that troubles me a little bit. Um, it's easier for the um, student who puts everything off or doesn't like to work with other people in a laboratory environment to get away with those behaviors. So, wow. Uh, discussions, yeah. Smartphone, Sam. Yeah, so there was a question on chat about um, some, uh, well, let's see, what was the exact um, question uh, 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 uh. oh cell phone experiments use using phone sensors yeah and yeah so, the barometer is one i use so i was just going to show that a couple of apps that, that i've i've used this one is called um oh what's it called oh you can see right now just so you can see what's going on right now it's measuring g-force um it's so it's it's a you know multi-axis accelerometer but here are the array of sensors you can get. Is this um, in focus for y'all? Yeah, it looks good, Sam. Yeah, okay. Okay, so there's all the different sensors you can get. I think that was a free app. Um, the one that I really like is this one, Lab for Physics. It's like $15 per student. It comes with a bunch of um, activities already written out. Um, an array of tools that you have, not as extensive as the other app, but this comes with um, the labs, all the lab activities done for you. So those are a couple. And then someone else in the chat mentioned Firefox. So there are a lot of, oh, let's see, the other cool one in here is, um, there are some really cool um, sonometers, um, FFT spectrometers. Hey, I see some good hey. comments about places in the chat. Yeah, the sound, uh, sound capable, sound capabilities in, in smartphones. There's so many apps out there. Basically, if you type a word, uh, a physics word into apps, you'll probably find someone who's written an app for it. Is that picking us up? Ah, uh, yeah. there we go. Yeah, nice, Sam. Uh, we also have a, a question from Kenneth, who actually has had his hand up for a bit, so it might be on a different topic. <laughs> no problem. Go ahead. How do I? Okay, there I am. Uh, I've talked to my students, a lot of my students. I, I teach at a community college, 30 student classes, sometimes as low as 10. And these are almost all engineering students or physics majors. Wow. And what they tell me is that the primary motivation is guilt and embarrassment in front of classmates. Oh. Uh, satisfying the instructor means nothing except guaranteeing that their discussion group is headed more or less in the right direction. To embarrass themselves by not knowing what the topic is about when a neighboring student asks them about it or not being able to contribute to the conversation in their group of three or four the embarrassment and guilt that that provides is what motivates them to study what motivates them to be ready for class to be ready for the discussion group and they tell me that doing it on screen doesn't work because they cannot be embarrassed by their computer. They can only be embarrassed by someone sneering at them hmm. oh. 
because they weren't ready and therefore could not contribute at that moment when they were needed to contribute. We do a lot of clicker questions in class. I do very little presentation of subject matter in class. They read the books ahead of time. They come to class ready to talk, ready to discuss. If they have questions, I may expand upon them, but I don't know what questions they're going to be. I don't know what I'm going to write on the board until students indicate their questions and their, their curiosity. And they tell me that if they don't have that potential for peer pressure embarrassment, then they don't have the motivation to really get ready. Huh, interesting. Uh, we also have an, another question and comment from Aaron. Hi, uh, yeah, so thanks, Kenneth. Um, I, I think that that's a, uh, I, I agree with that observation. I, I've seen that with students too on the Zoom um, where, you know, you, you put a question out there and they just, it's like, uh, it's, it's, it's really hard to get the reaction. Um, that you would normally get. And, and I guess to Mark's earlier question, I've been experimenting a little bit with, with lab groups um, using Canvas and yeah, it's, yeah. it's not perfect, but um, I think that once you get them connected with each other, uh, it's, it's been so far so good. I, I mean, I, I think that with the group work, it's something I've kind of shied away from in the past with face-to-face -face classes in terms of them turning in labs. Uh, lab reports as group work, but I think that now that everyone's apart, it's so much more important to get them together. Aaron, can I ask you, are you using something like Google Docs for that shared document collection? Um, I've told them, I, I should probably give them more um, guidance on, on how to do it, but I think that in the um, groups function in Canvas, um, there's a collaboration that ports right into uh, Google Docs, and I, and I think that some of them are using that. Yeah, um, we've seen that work really nicely. I'm glad to hear you're doing that with groups. Yeah, yeah, so I, it's, I'm kind of playing around with it, but I'm, I'm excited for it. And uh, I, I think that the other point that Kenneth touched on in, in terms of discussion boards, you know, if they're um, if we're doing things asynchronously, I think there's some opportunity there for the discussion boards to um, kind of give them the opportunity to like think through what they're working on a little bit more than they would if they were just given a whiteboard in class. And sometimes that actually plays to our advantage. Uh, but I think Mark touched on it last time, like the, the order of operations. I'm trying to remember how you put it, but the the way that they sort of have that conversation is a serial on the discussion board in Canvas. And I, I, I forget how you said it, but that's exactly the problem I've been having. Yeah. Uh, I think I made a, maybe this is it. I forget what I said. I say lots of things. Um, uh, most of them are random uh, as I say them. Uh, but <laughs> maybe it was a comment about the idea of knowledge generation versus sense making and the idea of, yeah. uh, labs, we, we like labs to do both, right? To generate knowledge, to show them in information um, and things like that. But we also want them to become sense-making where students start to integrate things together into a bigger picture. And that second step is really hard uh, asynchronously when the student is by themselves, without a group, um, without the instructor, uh, and it's, it's hard. So um, there was the mention of before, I think it was Sam said that, you know, we have these list of 50 things that we want each lab to accomplish. Uh, and that that sense making step is super important, but it's also really difficult, I think, to do asynchronously. Is that what I said? Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. As, as you're wandering around in lab during the semester, you can listen to student conversations and even though I'm not listening to that group over there, I'm still hearing what they say, and that will trigger me to then walk over to that group because, you know, something piqued my interest in, in what they said. Ah, here's an opportunity. Asynchronous, you know, online, you don't have that opportunity. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I think, Mark, you, you, you said um, something in, in terms of the the order if they if you're on a discussion board you know they're they're 
they're looking at what was the last thing that was said, and it's it's not in in parallel. Um, I think the way that Sam is saying, you know, if you're walking around a classroom, it's it's just a more organic uh, conversation. Sure. And and yeah. you know, you can assemble things in a more organic way than than in serial. Well, even uh, on the chat right now, right? Uh, you know, topics that people are putting in the chat are bouncing around, and some people can type faster than others. So uh, if you read through the chat, you you don't necessarily get a a uh, serial stream of information, but rather it's bouncing around a little bit. And that definitely happens when students are learning online too. Well, I have a question for Aaron. Um, do you have like a regular period of office hour type uh, discussion with your students or not? Um, yeah, so I've, I've kind of implemented a couple hours um, at a time where, or, or, or sometimes a couple hours a day, uh, a, a, two or three times a week where I'll meet with them. And, you know, I, I think given the feedback we got from students last week, you know, and just knowing my students, that seems like the thing to do is to try to um, make yourself available. Um, and it's not that I'm going over something in spe specific. It's, you know, half the time you're, you're troubleshooting or um, answering questions that have nothing to do with physics. I, I, I think we probably all have had that experience Unfortunately, that they're, you know, you're 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 helping to uh, troubleshoot some you know, something that has nothing to do with the, the content, but rather. I <laughs> I would I would comment on that and say that that's we found out during the last round of classes that maybe that is uh, one of the most important things about online is to just have like a regular office hour regular discussion uh, every day or every other day because uh, the students really were able to track themselves and keep up with the class that way um, much better than uh, just letting them look at the video of the class uh, lecture and then uh, come to the test. Uh, they really enjoyed the fact that they could come in every day or every other day, talk to the teacher talk about the problems they had with a problem or something didn't work or uh, what their um, perception was of something that was not quite correct. Um, that really was a big help with the last round of classes that we had. Our teaching assistants uh, found that their office hours were used online in laboratory um, in the, the TAs for the homework recitation parts, they, they always were used but it's like the first time they got questions about the lab going on, which is really interesting. Um, what were they doing with these questions about lab before? That's my big question. I mean, they just blew them off, I guess. But, uh, well, we are also coming to the end of our hour and our scheduled time, and I don't want to cut it off too prematurely, but I think we're actually ending with a really interesting question, which may be a good cliffhanger for a future coffee hour, which yeah. is, how do we use TAs? How do we use learning assistants in a virtual way? Uh, I think that could become very, very interesting. And even actually in the high school setting of, uh, is there a way to engage our graduates in the high school setting, particularly ones that may not be um, full-time students in a learning assistant or TA role for us? So uh, I think we should, stick to our schedule, but I appreciate uh, our, our host tonight, um, Dale, Dale and Sam. Uh, I really want to thank you for your sharing your expertise on demonstrations and labs and all the hints that you've been giving us. Um, we will, as always, take this uh, video and post it on our YouTube site, uh, as well as email out all the chat uh, text and any links that were put in the chat so everyone can see that. And if you were, um, not fast enough to write it down as it went flying by, uh, everything will become available to you uh, shortly. So I hope everyone comes back next week. Uh, we will continue to have these great conversations and uh, continue to show the, the strength of the A community. So let's say thank you to everyone and um, hopefully see everyone next week. <laughs>